I know, I just didn't want to say that. Oh, and the bell is back there. The bell is in my car. Okay, so I think we will get started. I'll do some um, brief introductions. This is a pretty casual uh, talk today, but um, I wanted to highlight sort of a number of touch points of the journey of becoming a professional artist and some of the things that are really important to consider, not only um, through self-discovery uh, in my own journey, but um, also just some emerging technologies that are uh, coming about that are creating new types of revenue models for artists that would be cool to know about, um, especially because everyone here is an artist. <laughs> uh, so uh, if you don't know, I'm Joshua Dirksen. Um, I grew up in Barrie uh, and got inspired here to be an artist. Um, I definitely, for me, in the, in the beginning, um, probably similar to all of you, uh, art was sort of like an escape or a, a means for me to find self-expression um, and definitely uh, fell in love with creativity in sort of all, all mediums, um, but sort of really honed into music uh, that happened to be my family's background on both sides. My um, grandfather and on both sides of my family were musicians and had albums out. Um, and, and so I had like a really rich family experience with music and so I was naturally drawn to music. Um, but I think most people that are artistic and creatively inclined are sort of fascinated by all the different aspects of visual art and sound and music and dance and, and theater and everything. So um, <clears throat> I feel like something that's sort of a shifting point for a lot of artists is the moment in when it becomes part of who they are. Um, they sort of, you start to identify like this is a core part of my being um, that I have to be and like can't get away from. Um, and it's sort of around that time I think that we kind of start to decide that maybe this is like the meaning of my life and the, the, or one of the things that I derive a lot of meaning from that I'd like to pursue um, in a more professional capacity. <clears throat> and I find that that particular moment is a little bit of a daunting moment uh, in our journey because, okay, but how? You know, how do we, <laughs> how do, we do this? Um, and obviously socially, uh, we're up against a lot of various types of stigmas around our careers and what they mean and what people in our families or our friends or peers like even think of that. Um, and we're trying to explain, yeah, I wanna do this thing that you don't believe in. <laughs> you know, it, it makes it challenging for, um, for us to sort of explore that in a deep way. And, um, I think one of, the, one of the bigger challenges is that unlike other career paths, um, you know, if you, if you want to become a lawyer, let's say, or you want to become a teacher, or you want to become a doctor, there's very clear lines of checklists of I do this, then I do this, then I do this, then I'm there, right? Um, all of those are like delineated paths to career. Um, whereas the artist's career trajectory is an uncharted path and an unknown path for every single individual artist. And so it's like you're in the woods with a machete, like trying to, you know, carve out an art career for yourself. And so it can be um, intimidating when you're first getting started to even know, like, where do I even begin with all of this because I don't really have a clear idea of the destination. I just know that I have to like do this thing and start pursuing it. And so um, for me personally, I found that like early on in my career, it was about immersing myself in like anything art related as much as I could just to maybe rule out what I didn't want to do or try to like identify a niche for myself. Um, and, and hone in on something specific. But I think um, for any artist, regardless of like where you are in your career, uh, a career is kind of built on staying busy. 
And um, I know that there's like times when it's hard for us to like be creative um, or it's hard for us to um, feel inspired or we're dealing with different things in life. Um, and the big challenge that we face is sort of like keeping busy doing the art and doing the work and, ha and showing up basically to the practice. So I think that <clears throat> um, one of the sort of major shifts when you start to move from hobby to, and I mean, I, I'm reiterating probably what a lot of you know, but one of, um, in case you don't, the major shift from moving from hobby to kind of full time is that stamina building to actually like show up to do the work. Cause show in yoga they say showing up to the mat. You know, it's like you have to start building the stamina to output consistently because um, that's really <clears throat> what it takes. You know, any other job, excuse me, <clears throat> you'd have to show up every day, um, <clears throat> and that could be really challenging when you start in a practice that's about expression and it's about emotion and it's kind of whenever you feel like it. Um, now I want to create at 4 a.m. because whatever. <laughs> so um, I think that that's such an important moment for starting to take your work seriously is I'm going to commit to building up the stamina to actually output work um, and really I think that that is the key identifier that sort of like determines if this is a good path for you <laughs> or, or if you should maybe consider art being something that's a personal capacity, that, you know, something that you just do for you. Um, because obviously when you decide to make money off your art, the relationship with the art making process changes significantly. Um, so I, I, want, I want to speak to that a little bit. Obviously, we all have to work and survive and live. Um, and I think <clears throat> there's a lot of different advice about this where it's like, you know, go get a job in the field so you're getting at least peripheral experience or have a cash cow that's funding your career or rely solely on grants and don't, don't do art unless it's funded um, or just do it in all your spare time and fill up, you know, your bandwidth as much as possible. I don't think there's a right answer, but I do think that a huge moment in, in shifting is when you start to subsidize your income with your actual work and your actual, um, <clears throat> you're generating income from your art, which can be a really exciting moment. Um, and I think is sort of like the first aha, eureka, like empowering moment for all of us as artists. Like, wow, I got paid to like make this thing and like maybe this is possible. Maybe I can pursue a career like this. Um, <clears throat> now, naturally that kind of like leads to um, more conversations about your own worth. Um, and another struggle that we face as artists is actually valuing the work that we're doing and valuing the things that we're trying to contribute or what we're trying to say in our work. Um, and it, it can become challenging to sort of, um, first of all, communicate uh, what our value is and also just have like self-awareness of um, the, you know, the level of our work <clears throat> um, and, and being really realistic about uh, how much time our work takes and then getting comfortable actually charging for that time or not even the time, but charging for the experience um, and the unique offerings. So <clears throat> that can really be um, kind of challenging to get comfortable charging more for less. Like as we get faster in our practices and as we get better at our practices, they're quicker, we're able to output faster, we're able to create products, and um, if you want to call them that. And uh, you know, it can feel a little strange to charge more when you're doing like a lot less or you're doing something that you consider simple. Um, so for myself, I've always tried to look at it as um, the, the time investment of years and years and years of honing artistic practice is worth something. And um, it's really important to recognize that speed and efficiency matter and that um, <clears throat> if you're able to be hired in another field to deliver something incredibly well quickly, you're paid more, you know? So we have to start looking at ourselves 
a little bit more in that light, um, even though, again, the art making process is a little less linear sometimes, um, it is really important that um, we start to sort of like focus in on that. And I was also gonna say that um, we also wanna kind of make sure to, you know, start to say no more often too. I think, I, I talk to Katie about this a lot, but like I have a really bad habit of personally saying yes to any opportunity in the arts I can get because I just want to have my schedule full and I want to continue to like chip away at all of the possible things I could be involved in and then like look back and go, look at all the things that I did. I had a career, but um, often, you know, it can really be detrimental to potentially honing in on a very specific vision for yourself, or it can take away from the caliber of the work you're doing because you're just sort of like overloading <laughs> your abilities uh, to manage everything and juggle everything. Um, now I think, I think this leads me to an, uh, the next section that I want to talk about, which is just um, art for you versus art for hire, and kind of the like, the uh, philosophies about art and how we approach art making. Um, I had a friend in university who I deeply admire, her name's Sarah Walterhouse, and she is a visual artist. Um, and she did something that really shocked me. She told me that art isn't precious and she spent like two years working on this massive exhibition um, of these huge, huge pieces of you know, charcoal work. Um, and she did this incredible um, exhibition of all of her work and everyone was there who needed to be there and it was for like her final fine arts degree. Um, and then she completely turned it on its head and made it a performance piece and destroyed everything in there and like everybody was completely shocked. It destroyed all of her work. And was making a statement that, it, that uh, it's, um, it's the process for us that's important and um, you know that there's so much emphasis on like the final product but like the final product when it's done it's like not none of your business anymore you know your the the beautiful exchange that you get for creating and doing um, it, she was making a point that that uh, was at the core of what she believed the art making was all about which I deeply respected <laughs> I just thought it was pretty bold um, to do and so I think, you know, I'm not saying that that is what art means by any means. What I'm saying is um, when we start to shift to making um, uh, our work, um, you know, sort of a viable income stream, our relationship with the work changes and we have to ask ourselves the question about, you know, how close am I to this work? Is this work really personal to me? Is it gonna you know, require a lot of courage for me to put this particular work out there? Um, do I not care about this work at all? Um, you know, is this kind of like throwaway? Does this not matter? And I'm happy to like get rid of this to make some money off of it. And so the, the more important thing is, you know, for anyone that's looking to really start to, to move into a serious professional arts career, that self-examination of what is my artistic identity and my relationship with my work look like and um, how, you know, how does that change when it's hired and it's, it, it becomes a product. Um, and, and so I like to <coughs> say this analogy, which I say sometimes, which is um, there's like craftsmen art making and there's like art artisan art making it, what I mean by that is um, if I was say like a chair builder um, and there was I had you know hand carved these chairs for my own personal dining room set for years and years and years I would never sell those chairs those would be really personal chairs for myself that I would keep in my home for a lifetime and hand hand them over to my future family um, Whereas if you asked me to make you a chair, I could trust in my artistic skills and my intelligence and my creativity to build you a chair that functions like a chair that you would be happy with that is a chair. It is a beautiful chair, but it's not my set of chairs. Mm -hmm. And I, somewhere along the lines of my practice with music, I started to compartmentalize 
this stuff is for me. This is rooted in things that I went through that I don't want to put on public display that I would like to keep for myself um, or have just a different relationship with it. I don't want it to be for monetary exchange. I don't want this art to be through a capitalistic model. Um, I'm like that with my painting. I just won't ever sell paintings because I just, I, for me, that's a therapeutic practice for me that I just don't want to force through a particular capitalist lens. Um, however, if you ask me to write you a jingle or music, <laughs> um, you know, music that doesn't necessarily need to have any depth at all, <laughs> um, it's really fun and something that I can enjoy doing is something that I can trust my you know, instincts and experience to, to deliver a high quality product to a client for. And so I think the thing that I want to um, point out in raising this idea is taking a look at your own practices and identifying um, where things are falling for you, you know, currently or where they could fall for you. And you know, a lot of art uh, a lot of artists talk about selling out or whatever, buying in or however you want to frame it. Um, but I think it's rooted in sort of your relationship with your work. Um, and so, you know, if, if, if you don't have a problem handing over your stuff to a corporation to, you know, have a brand alignment with that corporation, then you're not selling out in any capacity. It's when you are doing a dishonor to your own identity and something is not right in, in the exchange that I think you've got a little bit of a, a conflict um, internally. So it's an important thing to kind of take note of and, uh, and observe in ourselves as we pursue these things. Um, so this brings me to the like great question of how do I market and promote my work? And I mean, this is like our biggest challenge as artists is self-advocacy and getting our work out there and having people actually buy it. Um, and all of the like nuances of trying to figure out how best to go about doing that. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're living right now in kind of a, obviously we live in a digital age and we assume naturally that having personalized media outlets like our social media means we have a platform in which to sort of project and market ourselves for free, which is a really amazing tool, but we're also up against massive saturation um, and algorithms that are just working against us, frankly, and, and our inability to actually be seen. Um, and I think, I think what gets lost is some of the um, kind of traditional in real life personal connection to other human beings that is one of the reasons why art is so incredible is because it stirs people and it, it makes them feel things and um, it can be really hard to communicate work that is not meant to be represented digitally through a digital means you know especially a visual artist in here like you have to be in front of a piece, you know, and so it, it's, it becomes extra challenging to communicate your story and to do storytelling of who you are as an artist and try to, you know, have people understand you um, when you sort of are limited by the medium of video uh, to do that, to promote yourself. However, Obviously, it's really great to be able to have social media accounts, to be able to promote our work, to be able to post about it and do stories and, and like document our processes and, and connect with people and have audiences follow us. Um, but at the end of the day, this is a very business answer of me, it's got to convert to sales, you know. Um, Unless you're just the type of creative person that just likes creating content, ultimately you're trying to, like in theater, they say get butts in seats. You're, you're, you're doing that stuff because ultimately you're trying to drive interest in the art that you're doing. Um, now, obviously, too, like there are a lot of um, like peripheral successes that come from. Uh, you know, managing your social media really well. Um, and unexpectedly, like it can create a lot of opportunity, but it's sort of hard to quantify of like how advertising directly, you know, 
and it directly turns into your career becoming more sustainable. Um, and so, you know, for me, I've, I've always tried to keep that part in check because I think that um, a lot of young artists, and I'm not saying anyone here, but I'm saying a lot of young artists can get really obsessed with becoming content creators and 90% of their time is like trying to feed this content machine um, and outputting and outputting and outputting. Um, and it can, it can take away from the actual development of the work and the skill set. And it's, it, it is a really challenging thing that in our modern life we have to navigate and balance <clears throat> and figure out. And some would argue that, you know, if you're doing quick art, if you're doing like snippet art, you're not being true to the beauty of like that time that 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 a lot of art requires not everyone would say art has to take a long time but again the development process is really beautiful and usually the more time you put into work the better the work you know it just makes sense and so um, i think that artists can sometimes plateau and not necessarily get to a deeper level in their practice because they're spending a lot of their time not actually doing their practice. They're spending a lot of time trying to market themselves. And ultimately, <clears throat> the better you are, I think the more um, the people will notice you. Um, now, now, to just like bounce back to, if we are gonna use social media, <clears throat> it can be sometimes important to maybe um, seek um, external advice about how you're coming across and how you're communicating your story and um, you know you're you have a personal brand as an artist and it's coming across in certain ways and it can be really hard to be um, sort of self-aware of what whether something's translating or not and oftentimes I find like when I'm working with clients regarding social media in particular they think that they're doing all the right things because they're posting stuff that they're interested in or whatever. Um, but they're, you know, sometimes that analytical strategic approach can really, really help to just align not only um, what you're posting about, but just creating efficiency so that it can be something that you can manage realistically in your practice, but not, uh, but not have to like, you know, think too much and like obsess too much about it. It can really just be kind of automated um, and still incredibly effective, you know. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of people, you know, they do find like ways and formats to do that. Um, but it can be important to put on your analytical hat sometimes um, and not invest too much into a social media. Um, one thing just to uh, lay some foreshadowing for uh, something I want to talk about in a few minutes is you don't own any of that at all. And all of the content that you're posting to Facebook and Instagram and YouTube isn't owned by you anymore. I mean, you have intellectual property ownership, but you do not own the digital content. And there are limitations once you decide to put your stuff up that um, <coughs> for you to monetize on certain things down the road. Um, so we, we don't think about this stuff, but it, it really is you doing a whole bunch of work and working really hard for Facebook so that Facebook can make money off of you, right? So that Instagram can make money off of you. Um, if it leads to, you know, selling merchandise or people buying your work or whatever, then, well, there's an equal exchange. But generally, a lot of people that are just feeding an algorithm, um, you know, they, they fail to sort of see that there's no ownership there of all that content you're uploading, and they could take it down at any moment. Um, so it's an important thing to consider. Now, uh, oh, there's a nice little ant here on the... <laughs> um, This brings me to, I'm naturally inclined to do things that are fun. I don't want to do things that are hard or that I'm not good at. Um, I think the hardest lesson for me um, trying to make art a full-time career was that I had a lot of skills that I knew were important skills, but I sucked at them. And it was business skills and different marketing skills and sales skills that I really wasn't interested in learning at all. Um, 
but I kind of identified that all of the successful artists that I saw um, had those things. And so one of the big challenges is just like I said, not wasting a lot of time and energy doing social media, <clears throat> um, it can be really difficult to, uh, in parallel, to trying to get better just at your art and your work, to actually have to cultivate these skills that you don't necessarily want to do. They don't come naturally to you. You're not inclined um, to, to be motivated to do them, and yet you know with that kind of information, you'd be able to take your art career a lot farther. <clears throat> There's a Warhol quote um, that I've, he's fascinated with the business of art, you know. Um, and and that, that is, you know, there really is a business of art and there's a lot to learn about how to make art your business and the nuances of different art industry verticals and um, how best to go, out, uh, go about opportunities. Um, like, <clears throat> obviously, grants in Canada are fantastic and they're, they're an amazing aspect and <clears throat> most artists have to spend a lot of time like educating themselves and getting mentorship and like writing applications and failing many, many times just to get a handle on that one aspect of the business of art, you know, which is funding. Um, and I think understanding that there are a lot of different um, entrepreneurial skills that are involved if you decide to make art a full-time career is really important. Um, what it comes down to is not losing the joy, I think. Um, there was a period where I was running uh, my business and I was trying to do the, the fun stuff, the whole like reason, like it's 10 years in and I'm going, oh, okay, like I'm not doing any music anymore. Like what happened? Like where did, where did I end up here where like I wanted to like com be a composer um, and now all my time is on like my bookkeeping and shit. Like I don't, <clears throat> and I realized, um, that's just the, the hard reality is, is that sometimes it's, you know, 80% of your energy goes into managing your career to get the 20% of like the really meaningful part. And I think that that relationship that changes, um, it, it takes some getting used to. And, uh, you know, it's really important not to, um, not to lose sight of like the reason why you started in the beginning when things get really, really tough and when you're struggling financially or when you know you just like are doing the same thing and not getting a new result um, <clears throat> or you're, you've completely lost sight of like the the core of like it doesn't feel like fulfilling anymore um, so I only bring that up because it's a challenge that we all face learning these different business skills and trying to like hold on to what was the precious part of why we do this anyways you know um, and so, yeah, it's just an you know, important thing to, to bring up that when you're managing like a million different tasks and stuff, like make sure that you protect, you know, that, that, that core little piece of why you started down this path in the first place. Um, so this brings me to uh, sort of the, the new technology era um, and something that I'm kind of just excited to end this sort of like monologue <laughs> on um, and kind of break open to like a lot more of like a Q&A style discussion with everyone here. Um, <clears throat> but one of the things that is uh, some sort of uh, problems with tradi the kind of traditional um, real world uh, you know, art careers is obviously, um, you know, funding, there, there's been a lot of like, <laughs> The, it's difficult to have runway when you're an artist, to carve out time and space and to, to, to basically give yourself um, that chunk of, of like unbothered room to create. And, um, you know, also there's a lot of gatekeeping in, in, in the world of art, you know, um, people that are, are deciding what is good and what isn't good or, or lots of um, venture capitalist money pumping in sort of for music. It's, it's like, this is the music that's popular, you know, it's like if you don't have millions of dollars to invest in marketing, it could be hard to be seen at all. So it, there's, there's a lot of challenges. And then also what I was talking about with social media, you don't own any of those things that, that you're posting. So the creative control, you end up having to let go of a lot of creative control 
as you bring in different uh, people to manage parts of your career. Um, one of the things that I've kind of been really focused on is sort of future revenue models with digital uh, art and specifically in um, decentralized technologies called Web3. Um, Web3 is a fancy way of talking about the new internet that's forming right now from a lot of um, different <clears throat> technologies and developers. So in, in short, if Web1 was like the read era, which was people could search for information on the internet, but there weren't any platforms to publish anything yet. It was just a, solely a read era. Web 2 is the era we've been in for the last 15 years or so, which is the read and write era, which is you can search information, but you can also publish information on the internet. Uh, but you don't own that information. Those large platforms own that information. Uh, Web 3 can be summarized as the read, write, and own era. And in, in ownership, it's about the ability to encode um, the digital files that you're uploading with information that copyright <coughs> your digital work and actually uh, provide like transactional functionality. Like you can program digital files to do things that cannot be changed and are immutable. Um, so I'll give you an example of that. Um, has anyone heard of like NFTs before? I'm sure you're probably like, oh God, here we go. <laughs> um, we're gonna have a whole lecture on crypto. Uh, um, at, at the core, an NFT stands for a non-fungible token. Um, non-fungible just means like it, ca it can't be argued in court. It, it, it is what it is because it's on a time-stamped ledger that keeps track of every interaction with that file on the internet. So anything that happens to that file, if it's bought, if it's sold, if it's exchanged, if it's transferred, is all um, documented on uh, an immutable ledger that can't be changed. It's just a record. Um, it's a basically the foundational layer of information on the internet. And so what's really amazing about this new technology, um, why so many people are talking about it, why it's such a buzz thing, um, is, is because artists for the first time can encode their digital files to send them royalties, let's say, if they're transferred in any capacity. So for myself, I put out a song last year um, as an NFT. I put out 50 copies to a community on Twitter. Um, I sold all of those copies. It made more selling those copies than I made touring as a musician. And in doing so, those files ended up on some secondary marketplaces and then ended up getting sold and bought by other people. And programmed into the music file was just an automatic royalty for me. So my account permanently is connected to that digital file. And no matter what happens to that file, I will receive a payment. You can't send that file without a payment to come to me. So you can take control over your work and where it gets disseminated uh, on the internet, which is an incredibly exciting thing. Um, the other thing that's exciting about it is you can start to offer your communities and audiences and fans and patrons really unique experiences that only that artwork can provide through something called token gating, which is if someone has an account that they hold that specific protected digital file or NFT in, if they connect that account to say, um, you know, a concert or show up to a real life event or whatever, uh, it will, the information in there will communicate to the other platform and open up an experience for them that only they can have access to. Um, so it can become a really amazing thing for us artists to take our work and to have, just like with prints, have digital representations of those that are short batch or large batch collections of prints, um, digital prints, if you will, that are protected online, that can't be ripped, um, and can be like verified and owned by the collectors and can have pre-programmed things in them that protect, you know, sort of our compensation and, and, and ensure that, um, you know, we're paid when those things get moved around or, um, 
So yeah, that, that, that's uh, kind of, you know, something that I'm personally really excited about because I've seen um, the benefits in my own art career. There's a lot of downsides to, um, just like with any technology, you know, a knife, uh, it, you know, it could build a home and it could also cut your arm off. It's, I think all technology is a double-edged sword. Um, one, of, one of the downsides is a lot of different types of NFTs rely heavily on um, energy. And so they can be incredibly uh, bad for the environment just from an energy usage standpoint. standpoint. There's also stigmas around generative art and AI art, so our, our, you know, which I'm sure we're all thinking about and worried about. <laughs> yeah, so the, the, a lot of the projects that are getting tons of money pumped into them are sort of these generative projects that we could argue aren't real art by made, they're, they're, they're made by computers. Um, and those projects are making the most money, so it seems like kind of backwards. But what's more beautiful about, I think, the, you know, the technology is that we always look at our success through social media as I need to hit this many followers so I have that much reach so I get this much views so that maybe I get a little bit of income from the advertising on that or whatever. Um, this kind of flips that entire model on its head and says no, it's not normal to have massive and massive amounts of followers. It's more normal to have impact on a smaller community that's that's greater and so with a technology like nfts you could have a small community of a hundred fans that can support you directly and the monetary exchange is is far more significant because you can offer all these different types of value offerings um, and have a new revenue stream kind of open up for you that doesn't require you to grow a massive community online and spend a decade trying to do that. You could grow a community of 100 people online in a relatively small amount of time, you know, and they all give you $200. Well, great. Like, that's, you know, it, it, it creates a little bit of a super fan model and a micro, you know, audience model that makes it a lot easier for you to just create a baseline of monthly income. You know, that's much more manageable. So it takes away all that pressure of having to grow this massive audience, these massive fans, and not really sh being sure if that's going to translate to income for you. This is actually saying, here's my art. You can buy it. It will give you access to me or any type of experience you choose, and you don't have to worry about it being like um, you having a lot of supporters for that to be you know, beneficial for you. Um, so with that, I think it's probably a good time to uh, break it open and ha have just some questions just in general. Um, and, and, you know, for, for me, I'd love to kind of hear if anyone's willing to talk about where they're at in their artistic practice and anything that maybe you're struggling with or maybe, um, you, you know, you want to ask me about or want to talk about openly. but. Uh, yeah, with that, I'd, I'd love to just open the floor to, to any questions. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, when you mentioned that you uh, you made that series of songs, or that song that you had an edition of 54, uh, when you said that you coded in the, the thing that generates royalties, like, did you physically code that in, or did you, like, you, like, did you have to learn coding in, a, in order to do that? Okay, so you, like, is that, a, that's another skill that's sort of required of it? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I didn't physically code it in. A good friend of mine coded it for me. Um, um, but there's a lot of tools basically uh, that are making that process uh, like very simple. Um, just e UX that is like you upload the file and you tell it what you know you want it to do and it's the same as uploading to Facebook or Instagram. So those minting tools uh, it's called minting something because it's kind of like you're creating a token or a coin and it's a permanent thing. Um, those minting tools are getting incredible and they can do take a lot of that back-end coding off your hands so you don't, you used to have to know how to code but now it's, it's you don't have to anymore. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Could you introduce yourself and just give me a bit of a bio of your background? Oh, yeah, sure. 
Um, well, I'm Joshua. And, uh, <laughs> Where, yeah, where where is life, where's where life taking me? You, yeah. Well, and, and what you've picked up, like yeah. education or... Sure. Yeah, yeah. so um, I uh, am a producer, composer, um, and sound designer, I would say. Um, having gone to University of Guelph for classical oh, okay. composition, oh, um, so I studied okay. opera and classical music. Mm -hmm. Um, and then found myself uh, working at a film studio, scoring films in university. Um, and so I kind of like learned a lot about the composing process there and, and getting music placed in film um, and also running a recording studio. And so I spent a number of years um, recording artists and doing artist development and helping artists early on in their careers with marketing themselves and recording. Um, and then I kind of like, did a weird pivot into corporate marketing for a little while. Um, so I was working for marketing agencies in Toronto, um, marketing products for different big corporations. Um, and it kind of inspired me to bring all of that like high level, large budget information back down to artists to sort of help them understand that trajectory. Um, and all that experience that I had had in um, working in film, led me to found a, a company that was a multimedia company, uh, marketing and audio video production. Um, so I was doing like jingles and doing, you know, commercials and filming and photography for products and all that sort of thing. Um, yeah, and then all the while doing that, I've um, been touring in some bands, some signed, some not, um, getting music on the radio uh, and just having an overall, you know, career as a composer, scoring theater. Um, and then through the pandemic, I actually decided to go back to school um, to be a hearing clinician um, to continue my study of sound. Um, and so I'm just finishing that up um, in April. And yeah, so it's kind of changing. I was, I was saying before I was speaking, that started to change the like nature of my relationship with approaching sound and approaching like sound work. Um, like I did a residency at the Banff Center and when I did that, I was doing sound installations that were interactive with these different sensors and visual projections. Um, but I think now, you know, just having learned about the anatomy of sound and accessibility issues for people losing their hearing and, and also just thinking about the <clears throat> degradation of sound and, and our bodies, I, I'm thinking about approaching sound work um, in terms of installation in a very different way now. Um, yeah, I don't know. Oh. <laughs> so, so, oh, so, no, yeah. That gives me some context. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, proud winner of the Excellence of the Arts Awards at Barry recently, which is really good. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, three winners in this room. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah I, I, Heard of you, but I want a more broad kind of how you got here and influences. And you mentioned that one person that destroyed your work. Was that when you were at Guelph? Yeah. 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 She's great. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a really strange improvising band with her where um, we would take found objects and um, the musicians would improvise and she would uh, create the art. Uh, in galleries based on that improvisation. So the, the work influenced the music and the music influenced the work. We did that in a gallery for audiences. And that was a cool project back then. <laughs> it's like, wait, I'm in college and this is deep kind of, <laughs> <laughs> kind of era. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I really, you know, if anyone is interested in um, digitizing their work or having a conversation, I've specifically um, found a really wonderful eco-friendly ledger um, that's carbon negative. Um, the, the company that runs the ledger um, invested carbon offsets and it just was important to me from a value standpoint if I was going to put out NFTs that it was like not affecting the environment. So that was important. Um, so I like, I mean, I'm obviously open to, to that if anyone wants to talk about that more or more in depth um, because it's pretty neat and people are doing a lot of really cool and interesting things. Like there's a visual artist that programmed his artwork every time it's exchanged to lose a pixel and to, de and to degrade. 
So every time that gets bought and sold in exchange over time, it's going to just be a white canvas. Like Banksy who had his room destroyed. Yes. So there's really interesting things with code that you could do to your digital works. Um, or you could have, you know, one of your works split into 50 different cubes. Um, and so it, you know, only compiles together when you collect them. All, all sorts of things, anything you can imagine programming in. Um, so it, it becomes pretty neat. Um, yeah. Can you program viruses <laughs> Viruses. That's super fun. <laughs> well, in a way, was that what Banksy did? Yeah. Banksy was a, a virus. You know, since he was the most that it was sold. It was I, I don't think so. And why I say that is because it's information about, it's, it's like file naming information in the metadata. So I don't know if it's actually, it's in its of itself, its own program. It's more like programs read the file and whatever the file says is what those programs can do with it. So I don't know if that's possible, but I'm not a coder, so I have no idea. Maybe <laughs> someone, maybe someone will do something interesting with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, with the um, like programming various things into, into the NFTs, if say you like change your banking information or something like that, would that ultimately be lost? Um, so yeah, you've got a core account that royalties would go to. That account, um, if you were to lose the access to that account, then um, yes, because that's where you've that's that's where you've that's where you've programmed that information to go to. Yes, um, yeah. Now there are ways to like recover certain things. Um, you know, just like we can recover our password. So. As the technology is progressing, they're considering that and like making it recovery based because people lose things and then. Yeah. Um, but right now, it's like I have like four copies of my private key like <laughs> <laughs> dispersed in my house or whatever, just so that I don't lose access to it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I know. I know everyone in here uh, is you know at various places in their art careers and. Um, I think, I think just as a sort of a final thing, um, it's also just really important to like be grateful with how far we've all come in art. And sometimes when we're feeling jaded or down or struggling or whatever, um, we can lose sight of like the little you would be really proud of, you know, <laughs> like, you know, how far you've come and how, how you know, deep you've really taken this practice and so it's also just important when we're considering that we're like doing it um, that you know it's grounded in like <laughs> grounded in that in that heart in particular yeah yeah I mean if, if there aren't any other questions that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about is just some considerations for uh, career exploration and then obviously some new technologies that are um, I just want one more question about uh, with Web 3.0. Um, is there a time when like that'll just be the standard? Like, is there anything sort of that like we're waiting on, or like is it sort of like you need certain I don't know, say like software or something to access it, or will it just sort of take over the internet as we know it? Yeah, I, I think you won't you won't see um, you won't see big companies going away. Be right. like, obviously, they're going to have a stronghold. They have shareholders and, and all of that. Um, but we'll, what you will see is the emergence of um, decentralized organizations that aren't owned by anyone. They're, you know, programs or their NFT projects or whatever that have been uploaded to a ledger um, that will f just function indefinitely because they've been programmed to. Um, so. Yeah, I think a lot of things are transitioning. There's a lot of use cases coming on, like um, different banks are experimenting with digital currencies. Um, and they're not like uh, pro-crypto by any means, but the crypto is built on the same technology NFTs are built, but they're not necessarily the same thing. Um, so there are other things like transactions and coupons, for example. Um, coupons could now be, instead of like, paper coupons or whatever we already have these coupons but what what prevents somebody from like using it again 
well, you could have a you know, traceable ledger of transactions that says that's definitely been used. So there's all sorts of like enterprise use cases that are making this adopted um, just as sort of like a foundation. But the most important part to consider is this is called the trust layer of the internet, meaning I can trust that this has happened. Um, stock market's a great example of like, did that guy call in the order first or did that guy call in the order first? It's like, you'll never really know. And so one person can say, can you just get me a coffee? And then call in the order and that order gets the transaction. Um, with a trust layer, with a ledger, it's immutable, so you, you know there's an ordered sequence that's consensus based on hundreds of thousands of devices that all agree. So even if you were to say hack 50% of the world's devices, more devices would agree that, that that's what really happened in the transaction and that's why it's revolutionary because it's able to concretely give us like security that yes, these things are what they are. Yeah, it's kind of a weird. <laughs> I didn't expect us to go there, but, but yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on um, the human-created creativity factor in ChatGPT? How do you see that? Like we're seeing already Microsoft saying they're going to embed ChatGPT in, in their software. That's, I mean, it's here. So how's, how do you see that playing out and, and versus human creativity? It's concerning because um, the, the soul of expression is getting lost. Mm -hmm. It's empowering because a lot of mundane tasks can be offloaded. If I need to come up with five blog articles for a company on various topics people care about, it makes my job immensely efficient. And using, you know, we use tools to plow farms, we creating a tool to create digital information. So it makes sense, I think, that people want to have efficiency. Um, but I do, where it comes to art making is where I get more concerned. In terms of like text and writing, um, I can see why a lot of people would want to use it because uh, it just makes their jobs easier. Or it's a sounding board for prompting. You know, a lot of times it's like, I can't really figure out what I'm trying to see here. Let's have a sounding board or a brain shop uh, exercise and then from there I can like go off and write the thing. But again, also, the ability to fake expertise is really concerning because you can have people typing in a bunch of things and putting out content, speaking as if they're an expert in something when really they're not, and you've got an AI combing the internet. Um, I'm really concerned for what it means for art making, but I also think maybe there's an opportunity, which means AI, AI combs from the internet, which is uh, whatever's on there, and more relevant is what it will, sh what it will reproduce and create. Um, I think the opportunity for artists is to go away and bring work that's very clearly not, very clearly not generative work. Um, so I think there's an opportunity for actually it to become more distinct what is art and what is visual you know, generation of, of content for you. So I mean, I mean that, that's me being like optimistic. Yeah. <laughs> it, 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 could be, it could be, you know, it could be atrocious and destroy the world. I, I don't know, I have no idea. But I, I would hope that, you know, I think about a certain um, song that I wrote. I wrote a song about when the last human being um, is about to die. Um, Gaia presents herself and she says, you know, what do you have to say for yourself? Um, and there's a, a conversation with um, the last human being about what our legacy is, uh, you know, in a couple million years or whatever. I don't know if AI will generate a song like that, you know. And so I still think there's a lot of room for humanity and for artists to create art that just is impossible. And maybe we'll value it even more. You know, because we'll have, you know, we'll be so overstimulated and bombarded with content that we'll be looking for things that are actually more raw. And uh, so, I mean, that's my sure, hope. Sure yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. You can't replace the human, the human uh, emotion and a lot of other things that 
Yeah. I listened to a talk on the AI today and basically said that how uh, industrialization replaced a lot of blue collar workers, but the AI actually threatens white collar <laughs> jobs. But and then there's one expert who said um, AI is not going to replace humans, but the it actually, they said lawyers are most at risk because of um, how the computer can formulate a, a legal document, right? Because the law is out there. But he, they said what's going to happen is it's the lawyer who uses AI who will serve, outlive the lawyer who chooses right. not to use it. And so, you know, I even just think about shit, what if I just like every time I need to write an arts file? Write an arts file? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. It could actually free up all that 80% bullshit yes. that we have to do yeah. if yeah. we learn to use it effectively. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. That's a good point. Absolutely. I worry too about the whole way they started it. They just scooped up everything that was on the internet. People's yeah. images, music. Yeah. They just took everything and put it in, their, uh, in the maw of this library. Yes. And then, then you get the backlash. Because it's unregulated, we're always playing, playing catch up to this stuff. Big time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's cool. what. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Would AI be able to access NFTs? AI could technically access the art style and replicate it, yes. But AI could not, could not sell you something that's not tracked as like the authentic file. So I think that that's the, the, the differentiating factor. When collectors collect something, they usually want a you know, note of authenticity and those types of things for artwork. It's a, it's a digital note of authenticity. That can't be replicated by the AI, yeah. Which is important. <laughs> yeah. It is scary though, because I think a lot of artists too that have like banked their work on certain aesthetics, like are just completely getting destroyed. Especially um, digital artists, you know, that so many of their so much of their work just getting completely taken. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's freaky. And there's there's now AI for voice. Um, so you can you can pump video content of an individual and it'll scan the frequencies of their voice patterns and then you can get it to say whatever you'd like it to say pair, pair that with a pair that with a deep fake you know software and then you've got a pretty pr yeah really yeah and has already packaged yeah um voice and writing style yep used to, I think a DJ, DJ who had always wanted to collaborate with Eminem, yeah. just like did up, did up a rap mix for a big concert without asking him and they would get it. I saw yeah. a video on it yeah. And, yeah. and he like, it was, there was like thousands of people there. He's like, I won't play, like he won't like publish or produce the song like online, but yeah. every, like people could have recorded and yeah. have yeah. Like, video footage of it and then they put it on the internet. It, it begs the question, like, how far can we really go with that before we really are, like, wanting to reject what, what all, of, what we're, all of that that we're seeing? Because it, 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 it has to culminate in a loss of diversity, right? It has to. Mm -hmm. Like, when, you, when it just keeps siloing, like, and pulling from the same sources and not, not having individuality contribute to it, then it's going to, I assume, it's going to just all be the same. Like, it'll just get to a place where everything kind of looks like that oh, AI wow. style or right. whatever, um, which, get, again, gives me hope that, like, human beings can find each other offline <laughs> yeah and and you know create unique things again um, yeah it's it's definitely the topic of our times because in the next few years it's really going to be all prevalent a lot of industries are going to be affected by it I think I think part of your message that I particularly like too and I agree with is we have to think cumulative the cumulative effort over an artist's career that's yeah. what counts I had a theater person, uh, she did major professional theater for a long time, and she told me about, it was one of those moments when I'm saying, what the fuck am I doing to being an artist, right? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, we haven't taken the second vow. And I said, the second vow? She says, in theater, we all reach that point, and then we take a second vow. I'm doing this, and I know why I'm doing it, and I'm doing it for the rest of my life. 
And I thought that was very powerful because we do doubt ourselves and we do get banged down and it's so hard to make it out there, right? Cumulatively, you win, you know? Mm-hmm. You, it adds up over time, all that effort, it adds up over time. And it's a lot of fun, I think, having a good community as well. So yeah. that's great. I think that's like one of the mm-hmm. things Absolutely. I have, like having like, us all here and mm-hmm. just it's a community support and really getting out in the community. And just again, going back to like um, what you said, but like just owning that you're an artist and like, going back. Like, I think most of my, like, I'm active on social media, I get work from it, it's really good. But most of my jobs and stuff around here have been going out in the community and finally speaking up and saying, yeah, I am an artist. This is what I do, and then the like, word spread, and like just being involved and supporting other artists and stuff like that. And I think that's all offline. Like, so I think we, can, we all just shift going back to like, mm-hmm. and it's hard because I know a lot of artists are very introverted, and that's why they create and it's whatever. But I think it's just getting back out in the community. And, you know, now, n- now, not to put a, a spoke completely in that way, <laughs> <laughs> but. I, I observed something really interesting. Yeah. There was an artist that did a gallery opening in VR, okay. and he was like immensely introverted and suffered from social anxiety and said, I could never bring myself to do an in real life opening because just walking in the space with everybody, I was like, no, I had to like leave. It was like mortifying for him. Um, but in the privacy of his own home and the security of his own home and in a headset, he was able to come out of his shell and share who he was and be much more social and build a virtual community from around the world Mm -hmm. that could buy his art right off of his digital gallery wall. So like, I think though, regardless, it's community. But it's just the, yeah, (laughs) yeah. But but those communities are forming online in like various metaverse Mm -hmm platforms too is people want to gather and have these kind of new exciting experiences and stuff um, but yeah so I think for introverted artists it's actually an empowering thing to not have to be in real life because it's scary for them um, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've never experienced that so I don't, you know I'm I, I've always been <laughs> yeah and and like I, I also think that like I personally also like the connection of being with people in real life, but um, but for some people, like you know, they're finding a lot of meaning in those digital communities, and um, yeah, it's it's going to be interesting to see <laughs> see where it all goes in the next few years. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Yeah, I appreciate it. I love the conversation. It's going to affect all of us, so. Yeah. 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 Yeah.